Welcome to Smart Training 365. I'm Mo Larby, and today I have a special guest. Uh, you're not used to see him on this channel. Uh, we usually like have a similar thought. Uh, we we talk like on a regular basis, and I thought that uh, you will benefit from the conversations that we will be having. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, if you're watching us for the first time, uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, I noticed that there are 40% of people who are watching regularly our channel, but they are not subscribed. Uh, it will really help us if you subscribe because that will allow us to do more videos, more content, and it will uh, even increase and improve the quality of the videos that we are doing. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Doug Brignoli. Guys, how are you? <laughs> doing great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm the new guest. Yes. Yeah. You know why? <laughs> why? Because today we're going to talk about the other side of you. We're not talking too much about uh, biomechanics. Actually, in the second part, we will be talking about a chest exercises. Like I'll find some of uh, the chest exercises that we will be going through today are very uh, interesting. So uh, stick to the end of the video. Uh, yeah, Doug, I know that you know, most of the time we talk about biomechanics, but maybe some people sometimes forget that your uh, bio uh, bodybuilding beside biomechanics expert uh, in a, sorry, you're a bodybuilder, you know, uh, you competed at a high level. And I want to talk to you about what's going on today in the bodybuilding world. I don't know if you watched uh, the last uh, competition of uh, the Arnold Classic? No, I just saw photos. Okay, let me watch any you, video. Let me show you a short clip. Okay. And um, I'm going to show you also, before we start talking about this, I want to show you what Arnold said about uh, open bodybuilding. Looking to fix, you know, they don't have to worry about being massive. They just make sure that they make their body beautiful. And also, let's not forget, they don't have to take all of this stuff. Terrence that uh, some of yeah. the other guys are taking to be bigger, you know, yeah. and this is, I think, where the danger is, because in our sport, I mean, in the most dangerous sports in, in the world, the yeah. you have four guys, like in MMA fighters, yeah. four guys died over the last 10 years. In bodybuilding, you had 14 guys die over the last 10 years. So it just shows Side you chest. how dangerous it yeah. is to take some of those medications and substances that yeah. those guys take. And so, so I, I just think this is where the action is right here, what we see in front of us. This so is your Arnold, top four, Arnold. Yeah, what you have now is the top four seven. guys. Technically, probably the top two are in the middle. Um, all of them have beautiful posing routines. So I was really impressed by Logan Franklin, okay. uh, the Texan Oak. Yeah. All right. So uh, that was the winner, like the first one. He won the, the right. Arnold Classic. Nick Walker. Yes. No doubt that he's massive. You know, what do you think of his physique as compared to Phil Heath and Ronnie Coleman? And well, I mean, the first thing that I would say, the first thing I noticed was that he's not ripped. Um, you know, the problem with bodybuilding has always been that it's subjective. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it's a it's a contest of appearances. No one crosses the finish line first, mm-hmm. so it's not absolute uh, in terms of who wins. It's always uh, an opinion of the judges, and the opinion, of course, varies on individual preference, just like art and music. So um, I, I know some guys who absolutely love the mass monsters. Mm-hmm. They would rather see a guy who's massive than a guy who's ripped. For sure. I think everyone would probably agree that massive and ripped yes. is good, right? And I think that's what we saw with Jay Cutler. That's what we saw with Phil Heath. Um, Ronnie Coleman. Ronnie Coleman. I mean, there are a lot of striations, a lot of separation, you know, um, and mass. So the first thing that has to be acknowledged is that Nick Walker was not as lean as he could have been. Um, I was about to say as he should have been, but you know, I guess it depends on who the competitors were, right? If that was the best combination of things, then, then I guess it's safe to say that he didn't have to be better, leaner. Um, but my, my attitude is, um, this is again, personal preference Oh yeah, is that, um, being lean, um, and by the way, you, there's, <laughs> there's extremes of lean too, that some people would argue against mm-hmm. either from an aesthetic point of view or from a health point of view. Um, but it's always beautiful. I think to see muscle separation, muscle definition, muscle striation. Um, uh, and so I can't help but think that, he, that this person, Nick Walker did a trade-off that in, in, in lieu of being as lean as he could have been, he opted for keeping more size, dieting a little less. Mm-hmm. Um, which, by the way, you know, also makes me question these days how much leanness is being caused by diet, you know, calorie deficit versus just drugs. Right. So I think some of these guys are not calorie cutting very much. They're actually more than anything else just taking large amounts of thyroid and all types of, you know, uh, diuretics and things that, you know, help them chemically lose body fat. So look, I mean, I, you know, as I said before, you know, this is almost a, a, an issue of, 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 of semantics or personal preference. Some people like classic rock, some people like punk, right. some people like, you know, rap. Um, and so you can't say, none of us can say what is definitively better than what, but I can say that my opinion is that I miss the days <laughs> when, let's say, Sean Ray oh, yeah. had the most beautiful combination of mass mm-hmm. and definition and posing uh, and, and the others from that era, Lee Labrada. Um, uh, and, you know, I, 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 I would love to see bodybuilding go back to that. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful that I'm not competing today because today it's sort of dominated by drugs and, and, and mass and in the absence of, you know, aesthetics or certainly a compromise on aesthetics. Right. You mentioned two short bodybuilders. Are those like, do you have a certain preference or like in the, in the nineties, who was in your opinion, the, the bodybuilder who dominated the most? Well, you know, I don't prefer a short bodybuilder. Um, it might be that um, too much height compromises some of the mass. So it's, it's not common to see someone like Dolph Lundgren, mm-hmm. who is going to be, you know, six foot five or something, or even, even Lou Ferrigno, uh, you know, didn't standing next to Arnold look smaller than Arnold, even though he measured biceps mm-hmm. and everything else bigger than, than Arnold. Arnold had more roundness. So I like the roundness. I like the fullness. Um, Samir Banut, yeah. one of the best, if not the best of all time. Uh, uh, what's his name? The French guy. Um, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, um, Frank Zane. Look, I like Frank Zane. I always wish Frank Zane was a little bigger. You know, I thought that, you know, uh, the direction Lee Labrada and Samir Banut were going, and, and Sean Ray were going, was had a lot of the same symmetry and definition and elegance, <clears throat> uh, and, and still had more size. Mm-hmm. Um, Bob Paris, 
Uh, I loved Bob Paris's physique. The thing I didn't quite love so much about Bob's physique is that he didn't have any real gnarliness to his body. He didn't have a, a big peak to his bicep. He didn't have, he was very aesthetic. Um, and that's sort of, that's what happens in, in the game of bodybuilding is it's a, it's a contest of aesthetics and people can't control everything about their physique. Boyer Coke couldn't have great abs. Right. He had fantastic arms. Mm -hmm. You know, Tom Platt's had fantastic legs. He did not have a fantastic upper body. Yeah. So um, who, uh, in your opinion, dominated the 70s? Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I categorize things. So <clears throat> historically, yeah. um, you know, I, I got into bodybuilding in, in uh, the age of 15, 16. So this was late seventies, right? Um, I wasn't really paying attention too much to who was competing, I, but you know, uh, I, I I remember some of the names: Kozo Sudo, Shigeru Sugita, mm -hmm. uh, Serge Nubre, um, Serge Serge Nubre uh, is, has a legendary physique, and well, I saw he, one time like a picture they put both of you like him. Oh and yeah, him. well, what a compliment that was to me, right? Yeah. I mean, to be in the slightest way uh, compared to some Sir Serge Nubre is fantastic, but yeah. Serge Nubre was a, is a classic example of someone who looks absolutely positively unbeatable in a certain pose or from certain angles. I and agree. then if he does a lat spread or a double bicep, you know, he's not so dominant. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's other people that had other great poses, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I had some fantastic poses and some terrible poses. I looked yeah. great in a side tricep. I look bad in a front lat spread <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or even a front double bicep. I had great arms, but I did not have a lot of thickness in the chest. Yeah. Uh, and the, the problem with a double bicep is that you can't actually flex the chest when you're doing a double bicep. It just has to hang there. Yeah. Right. You're sort of flexing the lats and the bicep, but the chest has to just sort of sit there full and, and you can't actually enhance it by, you can sort of pull your arms forward a tiny bit. But yeah. does it doesn't do what it would do if you brought your arms together. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I just think up until, I guess, the 90s, um, the physiques were more to my liking. You know, um, Kevin Lavrone was incredible. Yeah. Um, and uh, who's that? Flex Wheeler. Flex Wheeler. An incredible, fantastic, gifted, really gifted. The um, on the stage like yeah the first time i see someone doing that was flex wheeler unbelievable to have that much muscle that, mass and yeah. yeah i don't know if someone else did it before him but that was the first time i, see yeah. I was like impressed you know kai green obviously yeah. was massive He's and he also had, and he also had you know i liked the sort of the unusualness of his opposing uh and he had definitely a full symmetrical aesthetic yeah. look. And of course, some people obviously prefer that, that mass. I actually would prefer a little less. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I, I liked the way Ronnie Coleman looked in his earlier years. I agree with you. Yes, he was different. Yeah. Now, does that mean that I wasn't blown away, impressed when he was the biggest? Yeah. Yeah, I was blown away, impressed. But if you ask me which which I prefer aesthetically speaking, I would say his younger years and not that much younger. I mean, maybe three, four years, you know, before he started really getting massive, I thought he had the smallest waist and the nicest flair. And, mm. but, but by the way, you know, age does do some negative things to skin and to, right. So, I mean, someone asked me about waistlines and I said, well, when you're 20 something years old, you're bound to have a small waistline. <laughs> yeah. Even if you're not, uh, even if you're doing the same thing in your 40s or 30s that you were doing when you were in your 20s, you know, just, I guess, natural distension of eating for that many more years, you know, you're going to get more fullness of the waist, which is going to change the symmetry a little bit. Right. Uh, the guy that I showed you, Nick Walker, in the beginning, mm -hmm. you know how old is he? I have no idea. I had never seen him before. never heard of him before. I think he is... Uh... 26 years old. Wow, he's really young. You know, um, 
Someone said that, uh, well, even Arnold in that clip said that he thinks the future of bodybuilding is in that classic physique. Right. Um, and I think that that's, I think that's safe to say um, for a couple of reasons. One is because it's more attainable. If, you're, if you want to attract new talent, new bodybuilders, if they see someone as big as Ronnie Coleman, they're going to just be discouraged. They're going to think, oh, my God, this is impossible to get there. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they see someone that is in the classic physique and, and, and they see the beauty of that, the aesthetic of that, not just the overwhelming monstrousness, um, then they might be in, enticed. So from a commercial standpoint, from a business standpoint, it makes more sense to encourage bodybuilders to maintain that aesthetic because I think it'll, it'll bring more people into the sport. Right. Um, but many people are impressed with muscle mass. And the bodybuilding show is about impressing. So that means if you're just going to say, okay, this is how it should be, that's one thing. But what the real people want to see, you know, I think the majority of people love to see big biceps, big chest, big, you know, legs. Um, so the supplements that we are seeing today are creating a different kind of size. Like there's no doubt that today's supplements that is on the market with the knowledge of the trainers, you know, and the uh, genetic of that bodybuilder plus his response to resistance training exercise contributed and his dieting and hard work contributed to enormous like size like this guy at 26 he's like this what he will look at 35 like he will be you know how wide you know yeah. so so how healthy is that for for those who are competing now and the future generation the, right. the availability of these uh, right. supplements look you know um I don't, I don't know what they're taking today. I don't know what drugs are taking and I don't know the quantities. Um, I, I have a, a general idea of what was being taken in the eighties and nineties. Um, I don't know how it compares. It's interesting. You know, when you have someone like Arnold who, you know, clearly took anabolics um, and, and, and for him to say that, you know, this is the, this is dangerous. So um it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to consider, right? Because Arnold's perspective was not whether to take anabolics or not. <clears throat> it's how much, <laughs> yeah, yeah, how much or, uh, or, or, you know, what kinds, what, um, I mean, if you increase your testosterone level by taking supplemental testosterone, you're taking something that's already in your system. So arguably you're not going too far from nature. But when you start to take something else that's not in your system, um, you really, I think you sort of tempt fate a little bit. Um, I, I suspect to some degree, the things that are most dangerous to people's health, maybe aren't even the things that are directly anabolic or at least testosterone like they're more like insulin or they're more like mm. diuretics or who knows what else is being taken right now. I mean, I know that if you take enough anti-estrogen, and you cause your estrogen level to plummet super low, that will create health danger. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you get super lean, you lose all your water, you lose all your fat, as uh, uh, Andreas Munzer yeah. demonstrated. He was incredibly lean, but clearly something he was taking or the something combined with the amounts was just really screwing up his own endocrine system. You know, I, I, I like anything, right? There's a point at which you say, can we, can we do this? Can we take some risks with some degree of sanity um, before it becomes complete, not only self-destructive to the person, but to the sport? Yeah. Uh, he said, I think there was, there were 28 people. I don't know how, how many people he said he, they died from. Like, yeah, I think he said 14 people. 14? Okay, I looked yeah. on the internet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from 2017 to 2020, there, there are 28 bodybuilders. 
<clears throat> I don't know if that number is saying like including all bodybuilders, you know, but there are definitely more than 28. Like this year alone, if you can, if you uh, count the women who died, I don't know, like if you look, if you watch um, T Nation, I think every time there is a bodybuilder who died, you see it there. Like mm. I remember like a month, every week there was a, an announcement of someone who, who died. Mm-hmm. Like it's crazy, you know? So even if they are not like, let's say dying uh, when they are young, many people get complication when they are older, you know? So with uh, my point is, Arnold, now he pointed out like they are taking a lot of supplements. It should like go this way instead of, you know, focusing too much on size. He didn't say for those who talk about compound movement and training, he didn't say that they are doing so much of compound movement and whatever that they got so big. He's Mm -hmm. talking about supplements that, that got them so big. When these athletes, use these compound movement uh many people will say yeah and that's why like the brick 20 are not movement that these athletes will use you know that's because they are using the big lift well do you think it's because of the big lifts that they are this size today well the first thing i'll say you, you may have seen ronnie coleman exceed, uh, receiving the lifetime achievement award right yeah um and of course he was on crutches yeah And now they're saying that it's possible that he may never be able to walk on his own again without those crutches. You know, it's easy to look at something like this in a one dimensionally, but there's oftentimes things that compound. Um, And so what I think typically happens is like, for example, you saw that one slide where they were saying that people that take anabolic steroids incur more injury. So it's easier, it's easier to, to look at that and say, oh, well, that's because the muscles get so strong that the tendons can't Keep maintain up. it. Mm-hmm. I think that's simplistic. I think what it really suggests is that the mindset that makes a person say no limit, I'll take whatever, I'll do whatever, I will go to any length to get big is the same mindset that causes them to take a lot of steroids and to train as heavy as they possibly can without actually knowing that the amount of weight they're moving isn't exclusively related to the amount of muscle load each participating muscle is getting. So um, I I think that Arnold doesn't really get compound movements. Um, certainly Ronnie Coleman doesn't get compound movements. These, these, these are people who believe, and I'm not saying it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's weird for them to believe it. I think it's sort of like basic for someone to believe, to assume that the more weight you're lifting, the more weight, all the contributing muscles are getting, but that's because you don't understand the role of physics. Mm-hmm. You don't understand the role of a moment arm. You don't understand that just like building a crane load is going to go here or there and in varying degrees based on physics. So Arnold was doing a video where he was talking about how he doesn't question the expertise of the doctors when it comes to the vaccine. Mm-hmm. But he says, you shouldn't question my expertise when it comes to building a big bicep. I know how to build a peak on a bicep. And I heard that and I thought, I don't think you do. You might think that having had a peak automatically makes you an expert. I would say no. I would say that he had enough knowledge and worked hard enough and did enough things right to get a a generally good result. But he'll never know whether he would have had a better result or the same result with less effort. Mm Um, or, you know, uh, the, the, the mentality of, of someone, there are a lot of people, by the way, is a very, very, very competitive time in the world. Everyone is feeling the heat, so to speak, of trying to be better than the next guy. And, 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 and this, to some degree, has always been there. They, they, they questioned a bunch of Olympic athletes one time, 
And they said, if you could take a pill, that would guarantee you a gold medal, but would also guarantee that you would only live another 10 years. Would you take the pill? And most said yes. So I think we live in a world where um, fame yeah. um, becomes almost the dominant thing. And, and people will do anything, anything to become, they would say to become immortal. Um, and, and some people who are adoring fans of Ronnie Coleman would say that they would be willing to do what Ronnie did and suffer the consequences that Ronnie suffered mm -hmm. if they could be Ronnie Coleman, if they could do what Ronnie Coleman did was to achieve that size. I've actually seen some people say that, you know, that he's made enough money that he can live for the rest of his life. I, yeah. you know, I, I don't know that that's true. I think people sort of adjust their thinking based on, you know, a mood. You know, I think Ronnie Coleman, if Ronnie Coleman could be persuaded to understand that he could have achieved the same amount of muscle mass by loading the muscles that he loaded as much without putting that strain on the spine, without doing this, without doing that, if we could convince him that mathematically, logically, the same could be achieved or better, maybe then he would realize, well, if I, if, if I could do the same thing without paying this consequence, then and I, I would have done it if I'd known I could do it. But right now, since he doesn't quite get that, and it doesn't really behoove him to believe that, it behooves him to feel that he paid the only price a person could pay for that kind of size and that kind of physique. And so he's inclined, he's incentivized mm -hmm. to stay in his, in his, in his, in his narrow focus. Uh, do you think if the winner of uh, like Nick, if Nick used solely the brick 20 with the type of physique he, he had and the type of supplement, you know, he used, do you think he will achieve the same physique that we saw today? Yes. Why yes. you're now, saying that? Well, it's, it's just very, it's just a logical thing. Let's just say that you came and worked out with me mm -hmm. um, and we did shoulders and we did triceps and we did biceps and we did lats and we did quads and we did glutes. I can promise you that you will get as good or better a feeling in that muscle than you've ever had in your life. Now, a lot of this has to do, of course, with intensity, right? So part one is exercise selection. What does that muscle do? What is the best direction of resistance for that movement? What is the best range of motion? What is the best early phase loading? What is all these parameters? Once you identify that, then it's just a matter of amount of weight, amount of reps, amount of sets. So if you're taking so much supplement that you can double or triple the amount of weight and sets, that someone who's not doing all that, then that's what you must do. But I can guarantee you that you're not going to get the joint strain, the skeletal strain doing these movements, than you would with some of the compound movements, and you get every single bit of the muscle stimulation you'd otherwise get. Hmm. Interesting. So um, how can you convince someone to do so? Like someone who is... Uh, a top bodybuilder, like a Mr. Olympia, should we tell them like, come, we will train you for a year. Like we try to find someone to prove to the world that uh, you can achieve that because people will say, look, Doug, you didn't compete in Mr. Olympia, whether your intention is to compete there or not, but your system is good, but we didn't see anyone who won Mr. Olympia with that system. You know, I, I trained with conventional exercises before. I, I, I made the comparison. Um, and that's why I say people should make the comparison. People should try the Brig 20 and see if they get the same kind of muscle feeling, the same kind of muscle pump, the same kind of muscle soreness, the same kind of muscle growth without the joint strain, without the shoulder strain, without the spine strain, without the hip strain, without the knee strain. Um, that, that if they were to compare that, they would have a better sense. But in order for them to compare it, they have to have an open mind and they have to be intelligent enough and logical enough. And what I mean by logical enough is that people typically have a logic side of their brain and an emotional side of their brain. And so people tend to have a belief that oftentimes leans more towards logic or leans more towards emotion. 
Now, if they lean more towards emotion, they're not really aware that they're lacking a little logic in their belief mm -hmm. or a lot of logic in their belief. They just think it makes sense to them. But that's because the brain has a way of doing that where it, 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 it for whatever reason, you want to believe this. And so you convince yourself that it makes sense. So what we find is the people that um, are willing to listen, willing to try, open-minded enough, intelligent enough, logical enough to hear the conversation, understand the role of physics, the moment arm, the direction of anatomical motion, the direction, if they can hear that, if they can process that and then try it, then they will um, be convinced. The problem is that a lot of these people have already invested themselves in the conventional way. And so a lot of people don't want to believe that they've done it in a way that was less than ideal. Mm -hmm. Now we have lots of people, Richard Baldwin, PhD. Yep. We have, you know, Stan Mori, PhD. We have people that uh, had told me before that they didn't think that I was making sense. They believed in compound movements. They believed leg raises were good, you know, things like that. And then when they finally allow themselves to try, they go, I should have, I should have been doing this 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it really does take a willingness to admit the possibility that you might have not had it right. And that there's a, a better way for you to finally give it a try and then, and then be further convinced. Right. Uh, how much do you think the trainers are contributing to the success of today's bodybuilder? Like what is the, uh, what can they add to think to the end result of these bodybuilders? Well, I, you know, I, I, I would be curious as to how much a, a pro bodybuilder would be willing to listen to a trainer um, who hasn't done what they've done. In other words, bodybuilders tend to believe others that have been where they are or farther ahead. So I mean, there's exceptions to the rule. Lee Labrada, obviously, is someone who's, because of his engineering background and because he's extremely intelligent, is willing to look at something like what we're doing and say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, mm -hmm. his competitive days are behind him, and so he can't really test it and prove it. Uh, you know, maybe if we, we would have gotten to him, <laughs> you know, 10 years, five years before he retired, yeah. you know, he could have made, and, and that can happen right now. Um, but I, I think trainers do play a role um, and, and, and can influence the future of bodybuilding. Um, because I think there are bodybuilders, a, per, a percentage of bodybuilders that are willing to listen to someone who maybe just knows more rather than having done the same achievement in bodybuilding that they've done or better. You know, I see, we both see <clears throat> videos all the time of, of, uh, of trainers uh, or uh, retired pro bodybuilders who are coaching someone and they're coaching them in a way that doesn't um, have any science in it. Yeah. So they'll say something like, we'll do it this way and turn yourself this way. And, but they don't say, and the reason for that is because this muscle does this. And, and sometimes they do that and they do that in a way that lacks some logic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but again, people are trying to make a living. <laughs> That's yeah. the bottom line. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you know, people will do what they must do. They must fake it till they make it. They must convince people that their way of doing it. I mean, Tom Platz's main message is intensity. When yeah. he does his seminars, he talks about intensity. He does not talk about mechanics, does not talk about physiology. He talks about intensity and doing the very most you can possibly do to the point where you're willing to drop right. after a throw set, up. throw up, pass out, whatever. Yeah. But but we know physiologically that a body can be overtrained. Yeah. Right. We know that there are limits, not only limits to how much the muscle can benefit, but also, you know, how far it takes to go the other way and be destructive and cause either damage to the muscle or the joint. So, you know, I mean, if, if more was better, we'd all be doing 150 sets a day for each body part. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I was uh, 
replying to a comment earlier saying that someone looked at that video uh, we did and he said like you and Doug are trying to sell your method of training you know we all know that compound movement is what pro bodybuilders used and they still use it. and you know your goal here is to try to convince people that your method works you know but if it was working people could have like uh, used it a long time before because what you're saying today is not something that nobody know about we knew about it and it just didn't work well that's a skeptic all right that's that's a skeptic look i mean nobody was doing lat pull-ins exclusively back then nobody was doing anything exclusively back then right because everyone was doing the shotgun approach and everyone mm -hmm. still does the shotgun approach they'll do three or four or five different exercises for a muscle that's a shotgun approach that's like well something's gonna work just do it all just throw the kitchen sink at it and something's gonna work right yeah. um and, and to some degree it often does right <laughs> but but there there has to be some logical explanation for what works better than what and why mm -hmm. Right. So that's what we try to do is we try to say, what are the factors? And that's what the 16 factors are. What are the factors that, that determine better or worse? Right. Can we say, and I think logically we can say that more range of motion is better than shorter or no range of motion. We can say that mm -hmm. we can say that early phase loading is better than end phase loading. Right. We can say that moving a, a muscle insertion directly toward a muscle origin and having it be opposite position loaded is better than not. Those are logical things. Right. Can you give an example for that? Because sometimes people like hear this language, they will be a little bit lost. OK, what so let's just say that? let's just say that if I reach up and I pull down, that's going to engage my lap. Mm -hmm. OK, now that's one movement. Now, let's just say that I bring that down. And I go back mm -hmm. now, is that better or worse or the same? And it's certainly not the same, right? We know that now I'm not moving toward the spine the way I was here directly toward the spine. Yeah. Now I'm moving slightly toward the back of the room, mm -hmm. but I'm also moving my arm behind my back and here I wasn't. So the only muscle that can take your elbow behind your back is the posterior deltoid and the teres major. Mm -hmm. It can't be the lat because they're pulling in. They're not pulling back, right? right? So Oliver, I've already changed the value. I've lessened the value as a lat exercise by changing the direction of movement. So let's just say I go lower and I go lower and I go lower and pretty soon I'm doing this yeah. instead of doing this. So clearly I went from lats to rear deltoids to side deltoid, right? So opposite position, right? If I'm pulling in the direction of the side deltoid, I'm going to load that more. Mm -hmm. than I was when I was doing this or when I was doing this. So these are the, the, this is the physics. This is the logic in order for us to know exactly what qualifies as best. You say moving the muscle or insertion directly toward the muscle origin is best. The farther and farther or farther away you get from that, yes. the less and less and less value it has for that muscle. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, you know, and then, of course, you know, we know that a muscle has a strength curve that's mm -hmm. stronger in the beginning and weaker at the end. Yeah. So logically, it makes perfect sense that if you compared an end phase loaded exercise with an early phase loaded exercise, you're going to be able to be stronger, move more weight, develop the muscle better with an early phase loaded. Mm -hmm. Right. So <clears throat> we're not trying to reinvent anything. We're trying to find what has always been there, right? Which is yeah. the best direction of an anatomical motion for each particular muscle. But the, just because, just because, you know, a muscle can participate as one of three muscles in it doesn't mean that that muscle, each muscle is doing the thing it does ideally. Yeah. By the way, he said that uh, we knew this a long time and it didn't work. I, I told him like, he, uh, Doug didn't claim that he invented this. He always said that those things are known for centuries. It's just he put them together and created a different result with them, you know, like the reciprocal innervation, uh, all these factors, like everybody had access to them. You know, it's like it was there 
why now when you picked it up and combined it and got something oh yeah but now you know that doesn't work or it's always been there nobody used it right well you know physics has always been there when isaac newton um did you know the principia when he wrote that book explaining how basically how the universe works um people didn't take that and say oh well then if that's the case then we should do this kind of exercise for this body part the physics was there moment arm the distance between the pivot and where the resistance is drawn in parallel lines with the direction of the resistance um, has always been there yeah now you tell me why you know no one thought well if that's the case why am i doing a barbell squat and only yeah. getting this much moment arm on my quadricep instead of doing a sissy squat now everyone has known the sissy squats are harder mm -hmm. now, everyone has known that right and you know what they think instead of thinking oh it must therefore be loading the muscle more they think oh i can't really load the muscle very well that way because i can't add it's much heavy. weight so the mentality has been that the exercises that allow you to lift a heavier weight is the yeah load the muscle more but that completely misses the point if it allows you to lift the weight it must be because it diminishes the weight to the participating muscle because of the physics involved mm -hmm. that would be like saying you know because i can lift a car with a big you know crowbar and i can jack it up like this then i should i should lift cars with a crowbar because lifting a car is heavier than lifting a 200 pound barbell no, because you know you're not working as hard because the physics have diminished the resistance such that it allows you to lift a heavier weight. So I always say, and you know, if something an exercise allows you to lift more weight, in essence, it forces you to use more weight. It requires that you use more weight to compensate for the reduction in order to get the same amount of muscle load. Logically, yeah. right? This is just... <laughs> common sense, right? If you understand, even without knowing the physics, even understand, you know that if you can lift more, it isn't because you're stronger, right? In fact, anybody can see that you can, you know, if you put a, a 100 pound barbell on your back, you can squat fairly easily, more easily than you could do a sissy squat with body weight. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that make you question? Well, like if I can do a hundred pounds added plus my body weight easier than I can that, Obviously, the lever angles, the limb angles, are affecting how much muscle load I'm getting. It's just common sense. Yeah. Uh, I think we will find a lot of rejection and uh, many people who will start listening to this video. And as soon as they hear that we are not on board with what they believe, they will click the dislike or like just leave and ignore it completely. And we are talking to an audience who are open-minded, you yeah. know, because I tried different programs before, like uh, any type of program. I watched all the Ronnie Coleman video, all Jay Cutler video. Uh, I had Frank Zane book. I have the Bible of... Um, uh, Body Bible, Encyclopedia Bodybuilding. Yes. Of Arnold, Arnold, yeah. You know, I, I did all those exercises. I did Athlean X exercises. You know, I tried them all. I can tell you that when I started implementing the Brick 20 on a regular basis, I never felt better. Like, I, I feel that I get more from the time that I spent in the gym. And also, I want to keep my flexibility and uh, agility when I play tennis, you know. So before when i used to like compound movements and all that like i i really felt that sometimes you lose some of that flexibility you know but with this way it's like i have more range of motion although i'm still getting big so uh my advice for people is before you judge you cannot say this doesn't work you know you have to give it at least six months you yeah. know and then you can compare but just saying like well oh, I, in we six months already know yeah Six months, yes, but I mean, literally within a couple of weeks, you know you're feeling better. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. feeling. No, the feeling. Yeah. You start feeling it from the right first away. Session. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not talking yeah. about the feeling. Yeah. That's something else. But you know, it's also worth it's also worth noting. You didn't know me from Adam. No, 
right? You knew Ronnie Coleman, you knew, you know, all these other people, you had no reason to prefer what I was saying, right? It just that what I said made more sense. Yeah. It just that once you tried it, you said, wow, I, I, not only does it make more intellectual sense, but when I do it, I understand, you know, where the thinking is coming from, the logic behind this, you know? You know, look, no matter what public statement is made about any subject, yeah. whether it's COVID, whether it's diet, whether it's fashion, whether it's politics, no matter what it is, you'll never get 100% agreement on anything. Absolutely. You know, uh, just, to, just to throw an example out there, you know, there is Carnivore MD, who not only says that we should be eating mostly meat, but literally makes the statement that vegetables have been trying to kill us for millions of years. <laughs> yeah. As if vegetables are actually predators. Now, I have some very good friends that are biochemistry professors, and they would say, well, yes, it's true that some vegetables have defense mechanisms, not all. Some are bitter, some are poison, some, you know, don't make you well until you cook them, then they're fine. Um, and so it is true that, you know, phytochemicals can be beneficial or they can be dangerous. Yeah. But, but to go all the way to the other extreme and say that they've been trying to kill us for millions of years is probably a little extreme. But you can go to the other side and you can say this plant-based movement now is saying that meats are trying to kill us. That animal proteins are trying to kill us. Mm -hmm. So you and, and these people are both vehemently opposed to the other, of course. And so you have, you know, people that are adherents to both. So what you end up finding is that um, we can say something that is as true as it could possibly be. And there will always be someone who refutes it. That's OK. Yeah. That's OK. We, we, we don't expect it to, you know, have everyone agree with us. And we're not trying and, you know, uh, let me put it to you this way. If I was competing with you in an upcoming contest in six months, I would hope you don't believe me. I would hope you don't use the method I'm using because it is significantly advantageous and I don't want you to have that advantage. Seriously, that's how much I can be certain that this method of training is advantageous. That I would hope that the people that refuse to believe are the ones that I will be competing against next time I compete. That's powerful. Please do not use my methods. Please don't believe me. Yeah. And if you believe me, please don't compete in the same contest I'm going to be competing in. <laughs> <laughs>